Aloha, I'm Lila Berg, and we're here at the Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii, ready to converse with the individuals who inform, inspire, and influence our everyday lives. Thank you for joining us on Island Focus. This section of our exhibition is right after the immigration, the plantation history. Mm. So th this point in history, the, the Japanese are coming off the plantations. They're starting to go into the community. They start um, starting their own businesses, uh, starting sending their children to school, to get educated in English. Um, so this is, that's what's happening at this point. Fascinating that in the classroom example here, there's Japanese and American flags. Yes and grocery and you know you were talking about how children come here people visitors come here to learn more about themselves yes yes this was significant experience for you too coming here yes it is you know my family didn't come as plantation workers they came later and so for me coming to the cultural center to to see this to learn about this history it was a way for me to um, talk to my family. And that's how I learned that, oh, they didn't come and work on the plantations. <laughs> well, and it must give you uh, even a, a deeper sense of being connected with Hawaii. Yes, it does. From your culture. Yes, it does. So significantly, you know, these, these photographs are not only historic, but they're very touching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, so much of the dialogue talks about, who am I? Yes. Am I American? Am I Japanese? Exactly, exactly. That's one of the things that we want, again, um, children to come by and learn about it them, them, themselves. I'm conversing with City Prosecutor Keith Kaneshiro. Thank you for joining us and I appreciate you spending some time with us as well. Thank you for inviting me. <coughs> you have been in this role for a very long time. Yes, I have been. And when you say in this role, I've I'm an older person, <laughs> but I've been in the field of prosecution and law enforcement for a long time, 30 to 40 years. And seeing the <clears> trends <throat> in Hawaii and, and being who you are and being disturbed by what you see, there are, there's a new program that you are installing. Yes, we have a program called the Prosecutor's Safe House. And what it is, is it's an apartment complex that provide living uh, quarters for victims of domestic violence, sex assault, or human trafficking. And what we want to do is we want to take the victims out of the environment of violence so they can testify. Because in most of these cases, you see when they bring the charges, as we wait for trial to, to go on, the suspects or the kids would threaten them, would tell them to uh, recant and not cooperate. And because these women, uh, don't have control over their environment, they live in a dangerous environment, um, they would re recant and not cooperate. But we want to make sure we're able to prosecute the abusers. And also to, mm. to reassure the victims that what they're doing is the right thing. Yes, what they're doing is the right thing. And what we want to do is we want to make them um, independent and uh, self-sufficient. Um, so what, in addition to providing them this safe house and this protection, uh, we also bring services to them that they need. Um, we help them after they testify, make sure they're able to move on. Uh, we'll give them job training and we'll even find jobs for them. So this is, this is city and county supported, but I'm, is yes. the state involved in any way? The state is not involved. It's strictly the city and county of Honolulu. The city council and the city have funded and bought this property. Um, it's a 20-unit uh, apartment complex, one-bedroom units, and the city purchased it at for $5.5 million. So the city owns the property. And this <clears throat> ties into your vision also for your role. Yes. My basic role and my main role is to keep the community safe uh, for public safety. And domestic violence, sex assault, and human trafficking are big problems that jeopardize public safety. And we need to go after the people who jeopardize public safety, the people who profit from sex trafficking, the people who abuse uh, the spouse and the partners, the people who sexually assault uh, women. 
uh, we need to make them accountable for their actions. In particular, you know, the, the topic of sex trafficking is uncomfortable for people to even talk about or to consider that it's happening in Hawaii, but it's very evident here. Sex trafficking is an international problem. It's not only in Hawaii, it's across the nation, and it's in other countries. And when you hear women being kidnapped and being held as slaves, it's because of sex trafficking. And it's people who want to profit from these women victims. And children as well. Children especially. Uh, what people don't realize, we see uh, students, juveniles, on the street as prostitutes and pimps who control them and profit from their prostitution. And we want to be able to stop that. With all of the, the negative things <laughs> that humans do <clears throat> and that your office is faced with, you still keep a spirit of aloha and um, positiveness. What's that due to? I'm from Hawaii. <clears throat> I'm from here. I grew up here. I want our community to be a safe community, a good community, and I also want to help the people here in our community uh, make sure that they're not uh, endangered, make sure they're not taken advantage of, and if they are, to help them and to move them. Because, you know, uh, they're my community, you know. I grew up all my life here in Hawaii. I grew up in Kalihi. And um, <clears throat> I saw it happen while I was growing up. I went to college and, and I came back and went to law school and I came back and I saw what was going on and I wanted to do something about it. Well, we appreciate your leadership and your vision and we look forward to the success of your safe place. Well, You're thank safe. you. We've been chatting with Keith Kanashiro, city prosecutor. Thank you for joining in to Island Focus. I have the pleasure of talking with Michael Broderick, who is the president and CEO of the YMCA of Honolulu. Thank you, Michael, for joining us. Thanks for having me, Lyle. Nice to see you again. Thank you. The YMCA has so many projects, and I know you have a few more going on right now. We do. You know, the, the beauty about the Y is that people think about it as a place where you swim in gym. <laughs> we, but it's so much more than that. We have youth programs, we have programs for chronic disease, and a couple that I wanted to share with you about. One is called our Come With Me program. This is a program for little kids who are between three and five years old, and we're trying to prepare them for kindergarten. And we go into low socioeconomic neighborhoods, Kalihi, Palama, Chinatown, and we work with the child and their caregiver, usually the mother or grandmother, so that when they go to kindergarten, they're ready to learn. What a novel idea to have early learning I know, in the community. <laughs> I know, but these are children who ordinarily would not have that opportunity, and all of them are scholarshiped. So it's a, a life-changing experience for these young, young kids. Now, the Y has always had programs for the very small into the senior years. Yes. We have programs to teach six months old how to swim, but we, we actually get six month olds in the water, mm -hmm. and then we have programs for people that are in their 90s. At our Kaimo Kiwai, we have 40 members who are 90 years old <laughs> or more. And these are folks that are actively involved in, in our programs. And we have programs, a Parkinson's program for people mm -hmm. that suffer from Parkinson's. We have a program for people who are experiencing prediabetes to prevent them from becoming diabetic. So many different kind of programs. The breadth is really impressive. So we are aware that the YMCA programs are community-based and for the community, but what you're speaking about is really overall family health. Absolutely, and you know, when I was in family court, what I learned was that you couldn't just focus on the child or focus on the mother or focus on the father. You had to focus on the entire family. And the Y, as you said, is a perfect example of an organization that does that. The other thing I really appreciate about the Y is that we try to work with kids that don't have as much as those who are privileged and have opportunities. So for example, we have something called College Camp where we take young girls and boys who have just finished sophomore year in high school and we get them together for a week and we teach them how to apply to, pay for, and excel in college. 
when we first ask these kids, do you plan to go to college? Zero percent. Hmm. It turns out that 80 percent after this program go to college. Even though many of the programs are directed at communities that don't have as much, uh, you have a fabulous leadership program. We have a great leadership program. Any child is eligible for that. We offer it in the summer. We offer it during intercession times. We also have a youth in government program that any child can participate in. These are primarily middle school and high school, and they learn how to write laws. They learn how to advocate for positions and in a civil and respectful way. I can see how your history and your, and your upbringing and your professional career have prepared you for this. Thank you. You know, I was the director of the state court system, so overseeing a large organization, and I was a family court judge. I had 10,000 cases, and that informed me about the needs of the community. So between the director of the court position and the family court judge, I think it, it positioned me well to help lead the YMCA. And no wonder you come with such joy and happiness. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, when I was in family court, as much of an honor it was to be a judge, the level of suffering that I saw, I can't begin to describe. The YMCA is a fun place. <laughs> it's, a, it's a place full of joy. So that contrast has been very good for me. Well, your leadership is well felt in the community, but also by all of the uh, staff persons that you have that have so much aloha. I appreciate that, Lila. I say I have not met a jerk yet in the Y. They're <laughs> all nice people. Thank you for your time, and we'll continue to support the Y and hear a little bit more about your new program. Thanks very much, Lila. Thank you. And thank you also for tuning in to my conversation with Michael Broderick, President and CEO of the YMCA of Honolulu. I'm here with Carol Hayashino, President and Executive Director of the Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii. Thank you for joining us, and what a pleasure to make your acquaintance. Well, welcome to the Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii. We're very happy to have you here today. Well, you are one of the happiest leaders I've ever met. <laughs> oh, I love it here. There's a challenge every day. What is so special about this place that you could share with us? Oh, my gosh. The Japanese Cultural Center has a really rich history, you know, very dedicated. It was created by volunteers. People who wanted to, we were very committed to preserving the Japanese culture, the heritage, and really looking for the future, a way to teach future generations about the history and the culture of Japanese and Japanese Americans in Hawaii. This is a, a special place, not only for history, but also for the future. That's right. Today you'll have a chance to view our exhibit, Okage Sama De, I Am What I Am Because of You. And the exhibit chronicles the history of Japanese in Hawaii from immigration through plantation to pre-war, World War II, statehood, and now the contemporary life of Japanese in Hawaii and how it's very much part of the local culture. What I appreciate so much about conversing with you even before the program was your value on legacy and how the challenge of change and continuity runs through this center. Well, I think that's our greatest challenge as an organization, and I think for many organizations. On the one hand, we want to preserve our history. We want to be able to transfer the rich traditional values of our Issei and Niseis to the next generation and future generations. But at the same time, we've, we've got to remain dynamic and, and adapt to the changing environment of the, next, of the new generations. And I often think about, you know, what will our legacy be? What do we want? What do we want generations 100 years from now? What do we want them to understand and know about Japanese Americans? Your energy is very contagious as this organization also moves forward. What is it that drives you to continue growing and changing? You know, I think it's my own personal story. I grew up, I'm a sansei, I'm a second, uh, third generation Japanese American, and I grew up listening to the stories of my Issei immigrant grandparents, my Nisei parents, mm. and their struggle, their sacrifices to immigrate to the United States and then to survive the incarceration during World War II 
and to reestablish their lives and the sacrifices they made. I grew up listening to those stories and appreciating what they allowed me to accomplish. And I, and I think I, you know, that's what has motivated me, I think, throughout my life, is to preserve all the stories of our past. It's a challenge right now with our young people wanting to be something perhaps that they don't even know they want to be yet. How does the Cultural Center support that growth? I think, you know, we try to reach um, the younger generation and many people, many audiences in many different ways. Through cultural festivals, we celebrate our New Year's. Ohana Festival, as you know, New Year's is a very yeah. big <laughs> holiday for Japanese Americans, for Japanese. Uh, so we, through our festivals, like the, our New Year's Ohana Festival, through you know, some of the traditional Children's Day activities. But, uh, so we, we conduct our cultural festivals, and then we also do our outreach to the schools and, and through our exhibit here, whether it's through um, learning of teaching history or through some of the cultural traditions, origami or martial arts in our dojo, or we have tea ceremony in our tea room. You know, we try to reach different people in different ways. Well, it has been a pleasure chatting with you, and we'll look forward to hearing a little bit more about the Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii when we do our walkabout. Great. Thank you very much Thank for joining you. us, Carol. We've been talking with Carol Hayashino, President and Executive Director of the Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii. We'll be right back. So this part of the exhibit is very significant because Hono Uli played a role in Hawaii's history. Yes, uh, definitely. Um, for us in the Japanese Cultural Center, our mission is to preserve the history of the Japanese in Hawaii. And when we found out that this place was not even known or found or, or rediscovered, we realized there'd be a big hole in that part of history. And so that's how we got started. What exactly happened there? Uh, it was an unjust incarceration of the internees. They were arrested on suspicion only. Not a single Japanese was convicted of crimes of espionage or sabotage during World War II. And what we see on the walls here is some, some poetry, you said, some statements yes. of how people uh -huh. felt while they were in the camp. Yes, internees were very stoic outwardly, but they released their feelings through poetry. And that's what we've put on the walls in light blue here. 1945, H.R. Lodge got permission to take those photos because he wanted to write a book and they're the only photos we do have of the camp. And you have crafts, and it's really a wonderful exhibit. Thank you so much for sharing all Thank your information you. and being part of it. Thank you. We're here at the Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii with Fire Chief Manuel Nevis of the Honolulu Fire Department. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. Thanks for having us here today. I would like to say Honolulu's finest. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you've done such an amazing job as fire chief because the coordination on the island of Oahu is tremendous. Yeah, it is. We, we rely on our partners, our first responder group, so the police department, the ambulance service, and the ocean safety folks. We all work together collaboratively. Whenever there's an event or incident, it's just seamless. That's one of the beauties of working on Oahu and on the island of Oahu. Whenever I meet a firefighter or someone with the fire department, they're, they're so joyful, mm -hmm. you know? And, and there's conversations about how they play volleyball and basketball, but I know they work really, really hard. How do, they, how do you help them balance the free time and then the crisis time? You know, it really starts at the very beginning when we select the folks that become firefighters in the Honolulu Fire Department. There's a real rigorous process that we go through and we vet out each individual. And it, it's been success, we've been successful in the past where we find people with the right genetics, really. You have to have a, a knack for working with people, helping people, and willing to give your all for the community. And so far, we've been a do good job in um, selecting. We have a over a 1,200 firefighters in our department. How do you determine whether uh, a potential firefighter has the character and the stamina to handle such crises? 
Yeah, even though you get selected, you go through a recruit process. So our, our recruit school takes you from the soup to nuts in the, the fire service as far as the skills, knowledge, and abilities that you need to be a firefighter. But you start with a 33-week recruit process in school, and then you go for another 18 months in the fire station. So there's a process where we really make sure that the job is the right fit for that individual, and the individual is the right fit for the fire department as well. There's a lot of creativity that's required as well to be a firefighter. Well, really, because every single incident, even though you've been to a thousand fires or 2,000 medicals, every single one is different. So you have to rely on um, thinking on your feet, making decisions really quickly, and that was, that's what makes a really successful firefighter. Did you always want to be fire chief? Actually, I didn't even want to be a firefighter when I first started. <laughs> it was a job that I took. I had started in accounting. I had um, gone through college and graduated in accounting, and I was on my way to become a, a CPA. And from there, I worked in the business area for a little while, and I thought, you know, I couldn't be um, confined to an office my whole career. And one of my friends was applying for the fire department, and I went along, and 38 years later, I'm still here, and I'm the fire chief now. So, you know, sometimes that fork in the road brings <laughs> us to a different path. Isn't it amazing how uh, one choice will make a difference? Absolutely. I know, especially in the profession, you mm -hmm. have choices that are made all the time by our firefighters. Yeah, you know, that's what we do, a, a unique style of leadership because you have to have two hats. You have to have the hat for the emergency decisions that need to be made at the fire scene or the emergency scene, but you also running a large corporation. The Honolulu Fire Department, many people don't know, is that we're one of the largest fire departments in the country. Mm -hmm. um, there are 35,000 fire departments throughout the country and depending on how you calculate largest, whether it's population served or area served, the number of firefighters, we're somewhere between the 15th to 25th largest fire department in the country. So out of 35,000 fire departments, you're dealing with a, an organization that is really um, one of the premier fire departments in the country. And that serves all of Oahu. Absolutely. So not only um, one of the largest fire departments, but serving a, a huge community. So we're serving over a million folks that live here and about 4.5 million visitors that come throughout the year, in addition to the military presence that we have. So it's a, it's a huge responsibility, but it's a job that we love doing and we love servicing our community. And we appreciate your service and also your time with us today. We'll look forward to learning a little bit more about the fire station another time. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. We've been chatting with Manuel Neves, Fire Chief of the Honolulu Fire Department. Thank you for tuning in. Hello for tuning in to Island Focus and joining me in a conversation with Randy Iwase, Chair of the Public Utilities Commission. Thank you for taking the time. Well, thank you for, for the invite, Lila. Can you share us a little bit more about your role there as Chair and what's the purpose of the PUC? Well, the PUC, uh, its purpose is to uh, regulate all of the utilities, uh, motor carriers, water carriers, um, private water system, private sewer systems, and um, the one that's always usually in the newspaper are, are electric, the electric utilities. You have a very uh, full professional career. And taking this on as a chair at this time in your life, um, what prompted you to take this leadership? You know, when Governor Ige asked me, uh, and I, I said it at, at one function, um, when this idea of food sustainability, energy sustainability, is not a new concept. It was there with Governor Burns talking about it, Governor Ariyoshi in the eight, 70s and 80s. But there were hopes and dreams at the time. Uh, now, today, uh, those hopes and dreams are on the verge of becoming a reality. And it is important, I believe, for us to do it right, to create an energy blueprint for our future that we can pass on to our future generations. That's our obligation, I believe, Lila, um, to uh, create the kind of better future that our predecessors gave to us. And so when he asked, it was an opportunity. I was excited. I was eight years retired, but, uh, and I would not have come out but for the fact that this is an opportunity to 
uh, create that future again. Now, we've been talking about future and sustainability for many, many years, as you, you said. What makes it different now? Because the technology is there, um, you know, we, we now have a sophisticated and cheaper uh, solar panels. We're looking at battery storage in the automotive field, hydrogen fuel cells, electric cars, um, wave energy, wind energy. Uh, I remember uh, Governor Ayoshi in the 70s talking about the assets of Hawaii being the wind, the sun, and, and uh, our, our environment. And now we can take advantage of the sun. Now we can take advantage of the wind. We can take advantage of the waves. The challenges are also greater at this time. Well, yes. I think the greatest challenge, Lila, is getting people to understand what this is all about. I mean, I was not in the utility field. This is complicated. This is complex. It's like putting me into a brain surgery room. You go, you know, what the heck's going on? <laughs> and it's all integrated. It's, and right? it, yes, it's it is. It's all connected. Yes, it is. The technology side can happen. Um, we, got, we put a man on the moon uh, in, in less than nine years under John Kennedy's charge to us. We can do this now. The we human can. will and the willpower of the decision makers and the willingness also of the public to participate, how does that all work in with what the challenges you're talking about? I think it's part, part my obligation to um, get the public aware other than electricity is more than just turning on your lights. Uh, it, it, it involves burning fossil fuel. It hurts the environment. We want to move away from that. We have renewable resources. It may cost more in the short term, but in the long term, it benefits Hawaii. And that's really kind of my job and the job of the elected officials. And Governor Ige has been a strong supporter of renewables. And, and Hawaii is in the lead in many respects in the renewable field. We, we must maintain that lead. I think we can get to 100% renewables by 2045. Uh, an island like Kauai on certain days are using 98% renewables with the solar and the wind. Hmm. And that's today. The, the goal of 100% is 2045. Well, we have a big goal ahead of us, and I appreciate you taking the time to, to chat a little bit about it. We'll hear more from you, I'm sure. Yes. Thank you very much for tuning in to Island Focus. I've been speaking with Randy Iwase, the chair of the Public Utilities Commission. Mahalo to the Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii for hosting us and to you for tuning in to Island Focus. I'm Lila Berg. Aloha and malama pono. Take care of each other. See you soon.